nos hace ondular Tu color y mi color Tu color y mi color Vayamos haciendo un lado Vayamos haciendo un lado Tu color y mi color Tu color y mi color Vayamos haciendo un lado Ya no tenemos razón Para ignorar el amor Para ignorar el amor Es tiempo de reflexión Good afternoon and welcome again. Bienvenidos. This is Las Noticias from the Border. I'm John Fanestel, Executive Director at Via International. And on behalf of the Via International team and uh, Via Cafe, our online platform, uh, we welcome you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun today. I'm really looking forward to talking to Ana Teresa Fernandez and Jason Wells, our guests for today. And I'll uh, uh, introduce them to you in just a minute. But I do want to first just begin with a brief uh, uh, shout out and a uh, word of thanks uh, for the life of Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg. I uh, don't know about you, but that uh, death really hit me hard. And I, I, I think uh, I felt uh, a great degree of mourning. And, um, you know, her legal career, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legal career was forged in the fight for equal rights, especially equal rights for women. But she was really a champion of equal rights in so many ways. And I couldn't help this weekend but think of the many, many cases that are uh, either coming before the Supreme Court or have been before the Supreme Court in the past that, you know, uh, her, her loss will, will really be felt. Um, I think of, you know, the struggle to reopen asylum uh, claims. I think of the struggles of uh, families to be re reunited, uh, you know, with their loved ones. Uh, I think of the, wa the waiver authority that the Department of Homeland Security has to, to build border walls willy-nilly all over the place, like they're doing right now in Arizona on Tohono O'odham lands and at the Oregon Pipe Captus National Monument. The walls are just being thrown up without any uh, protection of law because of this waiver authority that was upheld by the Supreme Court. Uh, and I just, and I've, I've heard from a number of people, a number of dreamers, people with DACA, you know, how, how fragile that, that status is. Uh, people with deferred action for childhood arrival and you know a lot of that depends or, or may well depend we'll see you know what happens under a new administration but a lot of that may depend on the the balance in the supreme court so i've really uh been thinking a lot about her this weekend i just wanted to to lift her name up um some of you perhaps have been reading as i have in the jewish tradition they don't really you don't say rest in peace um but the emphasis on uh you know a righteous life um a life well lived um, and also, uh, in some branches of the Jewish family tree, as I understand it, there's a sense that uh, somebody who dies on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, the new year, has achieved the full measure of the year, and in, in some ways, a full measure of life. And, uh, you know, uh, I think of her as an exemplary uh, person in that regard, who got so much out of her life and, and uh, accomplished so much uh, for others. So uh, I wanted to just uh, lift her name up. I invite you to join me in, in uh, you know, taking a moment to pause in appreciation. And uh, as I heard it articulated by a, a woman named Molly Conway to say, may her memory be for blessing, may her memory be for revolution, may we become a credit to her name. And uh, so I, I, from the borderlands, we wanna uh, shout out appreciation uh, for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. All right, with that, it's uh, my pleasure now to introduce you to our two guests for today. I'm gonna ask each of them to just uh, say a few words about what they're working on, que hay de nuevo, as a way for you to get to know them. And then we'll, I'll put them all together and the three of us will have a conversation about, uh, specifically about borders and, and uh, what borders uh, are meant to stop and what they're not. And uh, I wanted to first uh, start with Ana Teresa Fernandez. Uh, Ana Teresa's work explores the politics of intersectionality through time-based actions and social gestures uh, translated into a variety of media, paintings, uh, digital expression, and so forth. I, I know Ana Teresa because her mother is one of my favorite people in the world, uh, Maria Teresa Fernandez, who's here with us on the Zoom call today. Uh, and Maria Teresa is one of my close uh, friends and collaborators at Friendship Park. And uh, I've gotten to know Ana Teresa just a little bit because some of the work she's done has been on the Mexican side of the wall down there at Friendship Park. 
Uh, but Ana Teresa, welcome uh, to Las Noticias from the Border. And uh, que hay de nuevo? Uh, what, are you, what are you working on? Thanks, John, for having me. I really appreciate it to be here and on this platform. And I don't know if you can pull up the, the PDF. Yeah, let me work on, let me work on that. Um, one of the things that I was involved with before the pandemic was um, with a group called Art in Action uh, for civic engagement to helping with the census as trying to especially target the Latinx community here in the Bay Area and uh, a little bit beyond. And so they asked me to come up with a campaign to specifically be able to um, address that audience to be counted. And so we were talking about issues of, um, and with my work a lot is always there's issues of visibility and invisibility, as you see an image on the right that's erasing the border, which I did on the border. Um, but one of the things that happened was uh, when I met an artist, Arlene Correa Valencia, back in 2017 in Aspen, I was teaching her, she's an undocu undocumented migrant. Um, who was in scholarship doing a workshop that I was teaching. And we kept in touch because she lived here in the Bay Area. And uh, through the beauty of social media, one day she posted, um, you know, I'm so sick and tired about being, uh, of being spoken for because a lot of undocumented migrants do have a voice and people just don't allow us or don't provide us a platform. And so I reached out to her and I said, you know, if you could say something, what would you say? Um, and she said, we're not invisible. And so I sewed her, um, I sewed that phrase onto a sweatshirt, onto a hoodie that she gave me and she provided me this like high-vis hoodie. If you can um, scroll to the next page, please. Um, and so we, when I sewed it on, I realized that there was, because she is, was working with this, um, all these colors that were from migrant workers from her community, especially in Napa, the day laborers and night laborers that do the grape pick picking. Um, we then began working with and like up upscaling the design to make it look very like formal, like um, essential worker attire, but using this, we're not invisible, somos visibles. And we took this to art in action as a way to try and um, incite and elicit curiosity and wanting to participate with the census. So we, as we came up with this project and we actually got funding from Levi's, the company Levi's really liked this idea. So they gave us funding to buy a lot of these sweatshirts so we would hand make them. Um, the, the thing that happened was the pandemic occurred. And so we went the mail route. We asked people to send in their ballots um, of the filled out uh, census form. But Arlene and I were still not really happy with not targeting who we wanted to because of the lack of, most often they don't have technology or they're, they don't, the, they're illiterate. And so we got on the ground and started going into different communities. And if you wanna scroll a little bit more and setting up these kind of like makeshift pop-up um, shops where we, we brought our either our phones or our iPads and we asked people to sign up for the census and we would provide a free hoodie for them. And because a lot of these communities were, um, were that wore essential gear, they were super attracted to it. They all want, you know, they were like, we want one. And so for our kids, for our aunties. So it became this like really incredible campaign and uh, so much so that we actually went um, at night into the fields in Napa with the grape pickers and brought them hoodies and like followed them as they were uh, picking grapes to try and fill out the census because there's a huge stigma and fear, especially with the undocumented community um, of filling out the census. They're terrified. And so part of what we've done uh, with Arlene is really try uh, and inform people about what it does to their community, how it affects them positively, and um, break down those stereotypes uh, so they're, they will become visible and part of the community and be counted. That's so great. Thank you so much. So you, you said that visibility and invisibility had been a recurring theme for you, and I'm familiar with your work. You call it Borrando la Frontera, where you painted a panel of the border wall so that it was the color of the sand and the sky and kind of disappeared when people looked at it from a distance. 
when when did you first when did visibility and invisibility kind of emerge for you as a uh, an interest or do you recall was there a a moment of inspiration back in the day that got you off on that jag i think since a very early age um when we started when we moved to the u.s and we were able to go back and forth um uh, and having that incredible uh, ability and privilege to go back and forth from the border and be able to see the possibilities and the disparities between um, labor, um, uh, not only labor, but like psychological, intellectual <laughs> capacities and what women could attain, not only that, but also like all the, all the hurdles that you start looking into identity um, and you know, whether you're gay, you're trans, I mean, and how huge those disparities become. And so, and it's all, um, whether it's psychological barriers, whether it's physical barriers, I think that those became much more clearer going back and forth. And so since a really early age, yeah. um, that was pretty, became more and more apparent as I grew up. Yeah, we've been talking a lot in this series about identity and the, the fluctuating and, and you know forming of identity on the board in the borderlands and uh, how different people uh, you know embrace and express uh, different identities for themselves and their their communities and so uh, maybe we can return to that in just a minute. Uh, identity is one of those things I think that you know the border can't stop identities from <laughs> developing. Uh, but uh, Anate said, thanks so much for being with us. I'll look forward to hearing more about that, Kim. I was, I was really involved in the 2010 get out the you know, census count effort here in San Diego County. I didn't know I had that uh, interest in common with you. So uh, I would love to compare notes with you about that some, someday, but thanks for, thanks for your work. Um, let me go ahead now and introduce uh, Jason Wells, our other guest today. Jason is the executive of the Chamber of Commerce in San Isidro, uh, which all of us here in San Diego know is the home to the world's busiest land border crossing. And uh, Jason is uh, a leader in commerce and, and in many other areas. He's uh, president of the San Isidro School District Governing Board. Uh, he was, that was a past, uh, that was a past post. What's that, Jason? What's that? That was a past, a past post. That was a past post, gotcha. Yeah. And uh, also the past post of Petty Officer in the Navy. I think that's, that's behind you as well, am I right? <laughs> that's right. And then uh, and, and, uh, father, though, is, is an ongoing, I know that personally. Father, you, that never stops. So, uh, yeah. Jason, so glad to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. And uh, Kiai de Nuevo, what are you working on down there in San Isidro? How are things with the Chamber of Commerce and your your uh, your many biz, uh, small businesses uh, along the border? So, John, thank you for the invitation. As you know, I, I you know I talk border all day. Um, you know, really for us in San Isidro right now, is, is you know is, is, as far as the chamber is concerned, uh, we have all of the impacts that everyone else has with COVID and, and business closures and so forth. But for us, the major impact is something we can't control, uh, and that's the, the restrictions, the arbitrary restrictions placed on the border. Uh, you know, if this were an issue of health and we were somehow saving ourselves from some infected group, then then fine, we could work with that. But the reality is there's still 100,000 people crossing every day between California and Baja California um, to arbitrarily say, okay, those of you with visa, uh, tourist visas, you can't cross. Um, just, it makes no sense, no sense at all. Unfortunately for San Isidro, those that are US citizens and those that have the permanent legal uh, status, they're going to their jobs in Chula Vista, in National City, in San Diego, etc. Those that were shopping every day in San Isidro were that group of, of, of uh, tourist visa holders that were arbitrarily told, well, you can't cross. And so, you know, I have 767 businesses in San Isidro. Um, those that are on the boulevard, 95% of their clients, of their customers, of their families, of their visitors are coming from uh, coming across the border from Mexico. Um, and so when you're told that 95% of your clientele can't have access to you, then that certainly does not bode well for business. But you know, it's not just about money. Uh, we represent 6,000 employees. Those are 6,000 families who depend on their job um, to, to feed their children. Um, and you know, it's when CBP started talking about uh, essential trips and essential jobs, uh, you know, I, I said something at the time that I still believe in 100%. If you ask any child in America, their parents' job is essential. 
So who are we to say, you know, who should be crossing and, and, and who shouldn't? It's certainly in a fantastic binational community, like one that we've, we've built here. Um, so that, that's, that's a major impact for us. You know, California can reopen 100%, but until those border restrictions are, are lifted, we're, we're really just dead in the water. Yeah, Jason, you mentioned the, the immense, I heard, uh, I, I think you cite a statistic of 90 plus percent of that commerce for the folks right there adjacent to the board of the small businesses. I know they also closed the Ped West crossing completely for a while, uh, which would have been the point of access, I guess, for most people coming across on a tourist visa to, for instance, go to the Las Americas, the shopping mall. Uh, but then even to get up to San Isidro Boulevard, would the San Isidro Boulevard clientele, would, they, would a lot of those be pedestrian crossings? And, and which side of the freeway would those folks typically cross on or both? Yeah, the vast majority of, of visitors in Santa Cedar are pedestrians. Uh, as I said, with the workers, cars are going past, <laughs> you know, going through to other places. Um, so yeah, a vast majority um, of our visitors, you know, to the sum of, uh, you know, 30, 30 35,000 people a day uh, in normal times are, 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 uh, are pedestrians. Um, the, you know, and I'll say, you know, pat, you know, pat our, ourselves in the back, uh, Ped West came from my office. That wasn't part of the government's plans when they did their reconstruction. So we are proud to have that. And what it was, was not just giving direct access to the outlets, but what it was, was relieving some of the pressure of everybody crossing on the east side, the traditional side. Yeah. Um, and so it was very interesting to see that uh, prior to construction, uh, you had about 28,000 people crossing the border every day on Ped East, the traditional side. When Ped West opened, of course, they closed Ped East for, for a time frame to do construction. So it all shifted there. Then when Ped East immediately opened, then you probably had about 18,000 and 12,000. 18,000 going on Ped West still, 12,000 going Ped East. But very shortly, within a year from that, that came back up and, and now these numbers are increasing, which is why the math doesn't add up is because more and more pedestrian crossers were happening, crossing were happening, but it got back to where tr the traditional crossing, uh, Petty, Santa Cedar Boulevard uh, was the, the majority crossing. Um, and so right before the pandemic, we were getting about 35,000 people. Um, um, I want to say about uh, uh, 18 and, and 7,000, 17. Yeah, so it really was just, it was increasing capacity at every turn, both pedestrian and vehicle. That, that, it's really a, a flow of water, if you will, having to you know, get funneled through a very small pipe and trying to expand the, the pipe size. Is that an analogy that works? It, yeah, I, I use that all the time, the hose, because yeah. I did have a lot of small businesses on the boulevard saying, oh my God, if you make it so easy for them at, at Las Americas, we're gonna lose business. Yeah. And so at the time we had a little place called La Coqueta that sold, sold ladies undergarments. And there was Neiman Marcus in the, in the, and so I used to tell them, I said, look, the guy that's shopping at La Coqueta today is not gonna start shopping at Neiman Marcus tomorrow because it's easier. <laughs> you know, they're apples and oranges, yeah, uh, yeah. which is why it was so important that the balance did come back to, to, to Petty's. But I used to tell them, you know, as you just said, you know, the border crossings, they're like a hose. And so the more holes that you poke into it, the, it releases that pressure. And so everybody that's, that's now crossing at Ped West, they were gonna go there anyway. So yeah. it gets them out of the line that was going to, to Ped East. Yeah. Which well, was working great until about a month ago, which I think- Right, really yeah. <laughs> As with so many things, uh, yeah. I mean, and uh, I know February right now feels like about three years ago to me. I don't know about you, but man, it, the time warp of this uh, pandemic is really extraordinary, so. Well, great, Jason, thanks for joining us. And I'm gonna bring Ana Teresa into the uh, spotlight. Uh, not sure that you two knew each other, but when, when we figured out this date work for both of you, I really liked the combination because it brought the business and, and the, the worlds, worlds of business and art together. And the theme that occurred to me um, was just this theme of the porousness of the border. Um, and I, I'm thinking partly about, you know, the things that are so much in the news these days. So when people from distant, to the border read, they're reading about maybe temporary closures at the port of entry or the virtual elimination of asylum, you know, claims at the, at the San Isidro uh, or the mad dash of the Trump administration to build, you know, X number of miles of wall uh, so they can claim that, you know, in their uh, election campaign. Um, but the idea that the border somehow, you know, can be hardened is, is kind of a big part of our US policy has been for, for, for a long time and is especially so now under the Trump administration. But of course, those of us who you know familiar with the border know how, how porous it is, how, how much back and forth there is. So I'm just curious, either of you, uh, when you find yourself talking to somebody who's far removed from the border, somebody who doesn't really know anything about the border at all, how do you describe 
life on the border in this regard? How do you try to convey to them uh, the porousness of the border? I was going to let her go. I'll just say I, I often, a lot of our work has to, is done in Washington, D.C. Um, because again, port of entry issues are federal issues. So what I often tell folks is I said, you know, for us to go to Mexico, this isn't some trip you, you save up and pack for. And uh, for <laughs> us, it's like in the D.C. area saying that I'm going to go from Maryland to Washington or mm -hmm. from Washington to Virginia. It's literally crossing the street. And, and that's all that, you know, that that's all that that is for us, as far as the logistics side. And I'll let you talk more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, so what, how, how do you do that when somebody here, you were raised around the border, or how do you talk about it? I think it's hard for them to understand. I mean, I, we moved when I was 11 years old. So in some, what our first school that we went to, I think it was probably about 70% of those students were from Tijuana. So they were crossing the border every single day. And then we went to swim practice where the huge majority of the team in the afternoon would cross after their school in Tijuana, would come and practice swimming with us hmm. and then go back. And so there's these, and you would hear the stories about, oh, no, today was great. It was only an hour and a half. Oh, so quick. Oh, today was such a, you know, pain in the butt. It was three hours. So they, they were, they were it was a, an allotted time. It was like this vacuous time where they oscillated. And so that was always part of their day of like understanding that that time was gonna be spent at the border. Yeah. And I think anyone that doesn't live there, doesn't live, or when I say there, over there, where you guys are, it, they have a really hard time understanding that construct of time and that notion of waiting. Um, yeah. And it's not like a fancy notion of like waiting to be seated at whatever popular restaurant, but it's like, just like at a standstill waiting to just cross this like Oracle threshold, which is yeah. so, you know, it, it's like, it, it's quite physical, but it's also just this construct. Yeah, yeah. I, I, about, I remember many, many years ago, I walked across with a young guy named, his name in Tijuana, I met him, I was introduced to him as Diego, and he was going across at the same time. So we walked across together. I, together, I think this was back in the Ped East days. I walked across at Ped East with him. And then he was meeting up with friends. And when we came out on the US side of Ped East, his friend said, hey, Stephen. I said, Stephen, what are you doing with Stephen? Shouldn't it be James, you know, Diego in English? is being... He said, well, no, I'm in Tijuana, I'm Diego. But in, in, in San Diego, I'm Stephen. And I said, how does that work for you? He said, well, just, you know, I just kind of, I'm Stephen over here and I'm Diego over there. And they kind of, uh, you know, they just kind of work together. So, but this, the waiting time for him was kind of literally, you know, uh, changing his name or I don't know his identity per se, but his name and yeah, that, that time of waiting is, is a powerful thing. Uh, Jason, I heard the horror stories from a couple of weeks ago about these terrible, terrible waits at the port of entry. Uh, what was the particular circumstance of that? Was there ever an official rationale for making people wait in their cars for six or eight hours? Yeah, so uh, CBP had decided that uh, because the administration said only essential crossings should happen, that they deemed essential crossings to be from, you know, 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. and Monday through Friday. So basically taking care of workers. Because again, as we've seen from this administration, they protected cargo crossings, they're protecting the workers, right? So he can say that we were protecting the, the, um, <clears throat> the uh, economy, which they're not, but it's, it sounds good to those folks. So they deemed it must be, you know, uh, five, to, five to eight Monday through Friday. So they purposely uh, made the wait times longer for those who were crossing outside of those hours in those days. I and that's what that. we saw happening. And that did that resolve itself? How are what's the wait times now? Did they did they or how what's the how are people experiencing the crossing right now this this week? It, it's gotten it's gotten better. Um, in in you know the, the you know my argument had always been we have about fifty percent I'm sorry forty five percent of the border crossers pre COVID that are crossing now yet wait times are more than double. So that it, it totally didn't add up. But what we were able to do ourselves, along with folks from the Otay Mesa Chamber, uh, were able to talk to CBP and say, look, your notion of essential workers is, is, is false. There are people that work night shifts. There are people that work weekends, et cetera, et cetera. So they, that's when we saw a lowering of, the, of the, uh, the wait times when they saw they couldn't be as 
uh, you know, prescriptive as, you know, th these certain hours and these certain days. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's still not fixed. And again, these re arbitrary restrictions have, have got to be lifted. You know, 35% of my businesses in a normal year make their entire net profit between November 20th and January 6th. Yeah. Um, so if you add now six months of not operating or operating at a 60% loss to then not having a holiday season, um, that, that's, you're putting at risk at least half of those. And again, we're talking about 3,000 jobs uh, yeah. that are at risk, uh, you know, for that. Um, so our, my, you know, people ask me, what if the, if the restrictions go past October 21st? I can't even allow myself to think of it. Yeah. It's, we've just got to do everything we can to make sure they don't. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Um, well, Ana Teresa, let me ask you about, I, I picked this photo that I have in my background of the, the border wall down there at uh, Playas. Uh, and this isn't your work in particular, this, this, but it reminded me of the color. Uh, you'll, you'll probably tell me it was a very different kind of blue. <laughs> but, it, but your, your project, uh, one of, where you took a couple of panels on the border wall on the south side there at Friendship Park and uh, emblazoned the word empathy. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the origins of that uh, project? And, and uh, how, how are you, how, I, maybe my more general question is, how's empathy doing these days? Uh, crossing the border, but uh, tell us about that project first of all. I think it got, it hasn't found its path yet. I think it got a little lost somewhere, especially in this administration. Um, but I, I'm gonna have to ask my mom when, when we did uh, empathy, because I know that the erasing the border was done 2011 with the first separations of families and when the restriction came uh, where families were no longer allowed to um, meet at Friendship Park and through yeah. the post have those exchanges. And so that was the first ruptured, the, the first rupture, like physical rupture that occurred. And yeah. then we started hearing about families separated, with, which people were like, no, no one really talked about it. Uh, no one really believed it. It was almost like a mythos that was floating around and only uh, documentarians really seem to be able to extract these stories if you went to Casa del Migrante and, you know, such as Greg Reinoff, who's also a friend of my mom's that yeah. presented in his documentary. Um, but mom, when was Empathy done? Uh, uh, Maria Teresa, do you know? I think it was around 2015. It was when Dan asked you to do that on top of the uh, Binational Garden, the first That's that those panels are right above the binational garden, aren't they? Yeah, but I think it must have been a little bit okay, before so 2015. 2015. Two I, I'm, I'm assuming like 2014, 2015, yeah. before Trump. It was definitely before Trump. Um, uh, but it was an invitation from Dan from the binational garden who asked uh, if I would want to do something um, right above the binational garden. and. The only thing that occurred to me uh, was to extend, instead of doing a whole uh, panel of skies, such as the erasing the border piece, it was uh, bringing that same tone, tonality of the sky, but writing empathy, because at that moment, even during the Obama administration, it felt pretty imperative and something that wasn't really being recognized, especially for that space, as you know, he's come to be known as the the chief in, uh, what was it, what is his? Um, Deporter in chief. Deporter. Deportation in chief? Deporter, yeah. Deporter in chief, yes, exactly. So I think that that was kind of like me alluding um, very much to that point. And then, you know, lo and behold, Trump came about, um, but that was definitely what stirred it. Yeah. Um, and what, you know, that the word path being placed there, um, also playing with the, the the visuals of, I always think it's pretty surreal to have train tracks, something placed, preferred into the sand as an impediment for path. Mm. And so it's like redressing that impediment by putting the word path. So your eye can, you know, what is that? What does that elicit? Um, yeah. It's some sort of hopefulness, but also a movement forward. Yeah. Yeah. So that, uh, well, and so that site, I guess the sites we're talking about, the Port of Entry or, or Friendship Park or so many locations along the border, uh, empathy is a, a big part of the life on the ground. That's my experience. I'm most familiar with San Diego, Tijuana and Calexico, Mexicali. 
but empathy across the border is such a, a foundational part of the life of these communities and the many often cases, of course, families. But then, uh, you know, I've never heard that concept talked about when it comes to, <laughs> of course, you know, U.S. border policy or, or you know, high politics, right? So, uh, yeah. It's, that's another, it's another dichotomy at our border. Because yeah. our border communities have a surplus of empathy amongst yeah. ourselves, yet yeah. we're bombarded with a lack of empathy. I would love to go back to the lack of empathy we thought we had with, with the Obama administration <laughs> now. Um, and you were prophetic. <laughs> that is, and, and empathy is what, I, I think if there's one thing we're missing the most uh, yeah. right now, it, it, it is that. So. Yeah. Well, and, and you both alluded to earlier times, but uh, um, let me just ask, what, what is your very earliest memory of, of crossing the border? You alluded to your childhood, uh, Ana Teresa. You, your family immigrated from, uh, from interior, from other part of Mexico, am I right? Yeah, from Tampico, Tamaulipas. But our first, I mean, my, my very first border crossings occurred through most of, the, more of Texas, because Tampico's on the Gulf Coast. So yeah. if you go directly up, um, we had uh, some of our, our swim, swim t uh, meets um, competitions that occurred in McAllen or Harlingen. And so our first crossings were actually on a bridge. Uh, yeah. So we wouldn't say uh, La Linea, we would say Cruzar el Puente because there was quite physically a bridge that one would have to cross over. So yeah. when, when uh, it was so interesting to me when I first being 11 and the first time we crossed uh, in Tijuana La Linea, we were like, what do you mean you crossed the line? Like, where's the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my question was like, where's the bridge? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, where did it go? Isn't yeah. there a river that runs all the way through here into the ocean? And so my, my concept of, um, first of all, the border being by the, by the ocean yeah. and also not having something to crossover was just such it kind of messed with my mind uh the right. physicalness of it completely yeah. um was a little like uh crossing a line just seems so like yeah rudimentary i find it fascinating in tijuana you know i hear people say la linea uh el cerco el muro uh, you know various uh la, la raya i think i've heard people say la raya and i said what's la raya and they're referring to the the border uh, so all these different ways of, you know, kind of trying to name this, this uh, boundary, right? Uh, I suppose that has to do with different generations, maybe, or different, maybe Rigo or some of the other folks on this call would know more about some of that, uh, that slang and that, yeah, had you, Rigo, had you ever heard, I'm asking my friend Rigo from Via International, had you ever heard of La Raya? Have you heard people use that in Tijuana? Yes. Uh, uh, the other one that's most common to use is el, Al Otro Lado. Al Otro Lado. Yeah. Voy, voy para el Otro Lado. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had never heard, somebody mentioned it to me, La Raya, and I, I didn't know what they were talking about, the Raya, and I thought they were literally talking about, a, uh, I didn't know, an x-ray or something. I didn't, I really didn't. <laughs> uh, Jason, how about you? What's your very earliest memory of crossing the border? I'll just say it's funny that La Linea is such a, my kids, and when they're speaking complete English, will say, make line. And I'm like, oh, it's not make line, <laughs> not in English anyway. <laughs> but hacer fila, we you know that's just a part of life, right? Yeah. Um, you know, my story is a little different. I actually grew up in the cornfields outside of Chicago. <laughs> there were about two Mexican families around. That was it. Uh, I was sent here in 1995 in the Navy. Wow. Um, but immediately, I lived in Imperial Beach when I first got here for a few months, um, and immediately moved down to Playas de Tijuana and <clears throat> lived in Playas for 15 years. Uh, 10 years ago, then moved back to the state, back for me, uh, new to my wife, uh, to the, to the States. Um, but it was a, it was such, you know, I grew up being half black and half white in the Midwest. I grew up having a set of clothes you took to one grandparent's houses and a clothes, you know, another set you went to another. So for me to immerse myself in a culture or, or, or whatnot, not that it was, it wasn't a, a conscious thing, but it was just, it was very easy, easy to do. Um, certainly, like I said, we, you know, moving down there. Um, and so, like I said, I, I, I live my, I live, I've lived more in Tijuana than San Diego, right? For this, for this border region. Uh, my wife is from Ensenada, so I, you know, the San Diego and Ensenada corridor, I could, you know, drive in my sleep. Uh, but you know, we truly take advantage of, you know, the the, the best of both worlds. 
Um, and so now I have, you know, four beautiful children that are multicultural, uh, bilingual, um, but I'd say multi-empathetic, <laughs> going back to that term on it that I said, um, you know, to, to, to all the, and I, I think it's a beautiful thing to have right now, um, because as I said, empathy is really what we're missing. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Uh, uh, I'm going to close with a double barrel question, either one of, they're both big barrels, so, you know, do with them what you want, but um, I, I, I was, as I was thinking about the two of you together, I was thinking, well, neither of their work is expressly uh, partisan, but it's inherently political. You're just, you both of you are mixed up in the worlds of politics by the virtue of the kind of work you do. And so I'm curious to know how you're feeling, just, you know, how you're doing in this crazy uh, uh, election season, first of all, that'd be part one. But part two would be, uh, what's a hope or a dream that you have uh, for after the election, uh, you know, for, for another or a new day uh, in the life of the, the borderlands? Uh, yeah, how are you feeling about the, the high season of politics we're in and, and what's the hope you might have for the future? Either of you want to tackle one of those? Oh, ladies first. Uh, Anna, <laughs> uh, I, especially this week, I have to say that uh, two days ago, I, I felt, uh, even though I've been incredibly active from since the pandemic started, I think that there's a a thing that we are, as artists, are trained to kind of like matrix. And when I say matrix, I, I mean that moment in the, the movie where he gets shot and he's like bent over halfway and like skimming through all the bullets. That's definitely the hustle of our life is always trying to figure out. So when the pandemic hit, it's like, we just, uh, and I say we, a lot of artists and myself um, just kind of jumped to our feet and started recreating or re-altering and getting out of institutions and putting our work into communities in a way that was, you know, within the safety measures, but trying to be most tactical. Uh, but I have to say two days ago, I was, I, I just felt like a big blow um, with RBG's passing. I think that that was the moment where I was like, uh, and she was so smart to leave us at a time that would, in, place all the responsibility on us, you know, and not just like get everyone off that responsibility until she passed, you know, onto the next term. It's like the responsibility is really on us. Um, so I think that I'm feeling like I'm not giving up at all. And I think that that, that, um, that matrix thing is still happening um, and we're trying to do everything we can. Um, and I think for the hope of the future, it's just like something's got to change, you know. And 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 especially around the border, I think that empathy and visibility and humanity. I think that there needs to be huge injections of humanity um, thank you injected into there. So yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I've got a. A follow-up question on that, but I'll, we'll do that offline as I want to bring our, our time on Facebook. So, Ana Teresa, thanks so much uh, for, for joining me today. It's really a pleasure to get to chat with you. Usually when we see each other at Friendship Park, we're both very busy. We're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was nice, to get to, uh, nice to get to visit. Jason, how are you doing with the, 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 the season of politics and, and but hope for the you future? Know, I'll say professionally, it's extremely frustrating. Anything that affects our border, like these restrictions are, I would normally have an agency to work with. I would have an insider that's got an inside track. I would have uh, somebody to to work with, um, but it's strictly what's in the mind of that man, the, the how he wakes up the week before the 21st each month, um, and that's you know we're getting a real uh, we're getting a real insight to what dictatorships like we've seen in South America and other places what they're like. Um, I'm I'm I you know been doing this for 20 years. I have nowhere to turn to work with something affecting 90% of my businesses. Now, I'll say that on a, on a, on a, on a, on a professional level. On a fronterizo level, um, I long for the days, you know, I, again, spent 20 years giving myself to celebrating what the beautifulness between California, Baja California, the U.S. and Mexico, not just on commerce and trade, but a culture and people and food, like you see, it's a lot, uh, you know, every aspect of our binational life. And to have somebody come in now that is so divisive and so nationalist, it goes against everything that I think anybody on this call has ever felt. And then on a human level, 
uh, it, it, it's a hurt feeling that, you know, I've talked with old friends that are conservatives and, and they complain about, or they talk about where Trump's going to help them is, you know, they talk about things like loopholes in, in, in the ta and the healthcare system that they have to pay more than somebody who makes less and this and that. And I would understand that in normal times, but it hurts me that you would allow this man to destroy our country the way he's doing that because he can help your healthcare payment or help you on taxes or lower your taxes or, you know, these, I long for the days when we thought W was evil. I mean, you know, he's, he, he looks good right now, you know? Uh, he looks like but, such uh, a kitten. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's, yeah, it's, uh, I hear you. Well, well, Jason, thanks for your work and hang in there. And thanks again for joining us today. Uh, I'm actually going to just take the spotlight off of the two of you for just a second so I can get our, our other people into the picture and so that they can join me with a big round of applause. And uh, just as a way of saying, uh, join me in saying thank you uh, to Ana Teresa and Jason uh, for joining us. And uh, uh, folks who are here with us on Zoom, if you want to stick around for a minute, we'll just ask a few final questions before we go. Uh, but I'm going to sign off uh, by saying thank you for joining us. Gracias por acompañarnos here at uh, Las Noticias from the Border. And on behalf of the team at Via International and the Via Cafe, we'll hope to see you next time. Our guests next week are uh, Carmen Chavez, the uh, executive director of the Casa Cornelia Law Center, and James Gerber, retired professor of economics and uh, Latin American studies at San Diego State University. And uh, here's our close, and we'll see you, see you next week, Tuesdays at 12 noon uh, for Las Noticias from the Border. <laughs> Gracias.